Welcome back. This is Intro to Physical Anthropology. I'm your instructor, David Leitner, and today we're going to talk about stone tools. Just a quick introduction over them. We'll go into individual stone tool industries in separate videos, uh, but today I really want to talk about a little bit about sort of how we categorize them and um, and sort of what are the characteristics that make the difference between a stone tool and just a stone. Uh, and finally, the cultural and practical significance this had for our ancestors. So without further ado, let's get started. Now, we refer to different time periods based on the types of stone tool technology that were available then, but we use slightly different language depending on whether we're talking about Europe or Africa. But the key here is they're basically the same. Uh, the time periods themselves are the same. We've just given them different names for some odd reason. Um, and they kind of make sense when you think about uh, the way that the layers of um, sediment are laid. Think about think back to the um, principle of, um, of succession, right? Uh, so... Uh, Layer, strata are laid down horizontally with the older ones at the bottom and the newer ones at the top. Okay, So with that in mind, in Africa we talk about an early Stone Age, a middle Stone Age, and a late Stone Age. Whereas in Europe we talk about the lower Paleolithic, the middle Paleolithic, and the upper Paleolithic. Now, lower and early match up because early is the oldest and lower is the oldest. Right? Uh, middle and middle are the same, and late and upper are the same. Late, in this case, is the newest, and upper is the newest, right? Um, and these periods of time work out to uh, this long period of time from 2 million years ago until about 200,000 years ago, uh, where we see very little change in stone tool types. A little bit, and they're significant, but... We don't see a huge uh, proliferation of stone tool types. Then, in the middle Paleolithic, 200,000 to about 40,000 years ago, we start seeing significant innovations in production uh, techniques as well as the tool types themselves. And finally, by the late Stone Age, upper Paleolithic, we are seeing highly refined tools that um, do a number of specialized jobs, whereas in the beginning, we have very generalized tools that are sort of a Swiss army knife. They don't do anything great, but they do everything well, if that makes sense. Uh, or everything adequately, I guess. Um, uh, by the Upper Paleolithic, we are getting into very specialized tools, um, very compound tools, you know, combining other kinds of organic ma uh, material with stone. Uh, and... Um, with Homo sapiens, we then see them using that to exploit new kinds of resources. Um, so yeah, together, and we also talk about tools in terms of industries. Industry refers to a pattern of production techniques and tool forms uh, that are kind of go together for a certain period of time. Uh, the first of these is the Aldewan industry, followed uh, not long after by the Acheulean industry. Together, the Aldewan and the Acheulean make up the early Stone Age slash lower Paleolithic. Now, uh, this is a really interesting study that came out a few years ago. There have been, there, there haven't been a lot of direct studies of, uh, of the neural networks involved in stone tool making. Uh, but this was really interesting when it came out, I think. Um, the authors uh, decided to um, use uh, um, brain scans, specifically near-infrared spectroscopy, um, on humans learning to make Aldewan and Acheulean tools, and on um, humans do, learning to do other activities, like playing the piano. And what they found is that the same neural networks seem to be involved in each. So something as complex as playing the piano uh, it involves the same networks as it takes to make stone tools. And this shouldn't be surprising because there are similar activities going 
on here. There's a certain amount of trying to sort of build the reflexes and the feel of the stone and the way it should sound. And you can tell a lot from the sound. You can tell a lot from the feel of the strike. You can tell a lot by observing the, the lines in the rock. Um, and you are trying to manipulate it to get a specific effect. And you need to move your hands in very specific ways to do it. That is not so different from playing the piano where you are listening while um, also probably reading the 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 um, uh, the musical notes as well as getting your hands to do very specific movements in response to that. Um, this is this is a very complicated activity. This is not something you can just hand to any old ape and they will do it successfully. Even recent evidence showing that apes are making stone tools is kind of controversial because it's not clear whether they know that, that, that they're doing that or whether it's just luck. Um, uh, there's still some controversy around that as I understand it. Um, uh, I highly encourage you to there. I'm going to include this video and several other videos on flint napping on the website so that you can access them. I highly encourage you to watch it, uh, especially the demonstrations of actually making the stone tools. Uh, it is fascinating to watch, and you don't really understand how complex it is until you get into uh, watching somebody actually make it. Um, it is a remarkable process, and it takes a lot of executive function and planning uh, in order to do correctly. Now, in stone tools, we talk about sort of several main kinds of uh, um, artifacts. First, we have cores. Cores are larger rocks, usually river stones, that uh, provide the material that the stone tool will be made of. Um, usually, uh, Sometimes the material you remove is the material that you're after. Sometimes it's the material you remove is shaping the core into the tool you want. Uh, so it can work both ways, though oftentimes, uh, uh, especially later on, it's the flakes that become important. Now, flakes themselves are very interesting. Uh, they have to be removed from the core by striking. And... Um, uh, they have very telltale shapes. There are only certain kinds of rock that you're able to make stone tools out of, you know, um, it's hard to make uh, stone tools out of plain sedimentary rocks, but volcanic rocks of any kind, even certain kinds of granite, can produce a nice sharp edge. Uh, the best are volcanic glasses like obsidian and uh, chert and flint, that sort of thing. And what you get when you get a flake, you're, you're usually hitting a flat, a flat point somewhere on the top of the core. And the place where it strikes creates a shock wave that travels through the flake, separating it from the core. And as a result, you will literally have this bulb at the site where it was struck with these radiating striations, these ripples. That, that radiate outwards from the point of impact. Uh, that is called the bulb of percussion. It's very, it's a very telltale sign that you've got a flake. And the reverse is true on the, on the core. You'll have this indentation that looks like the bulb of percussion, uh, on, left on the core, which is why a flake will almost always have two sides. One that's going to be this nice smooth side here, and another that has all these concave, um, uh, valleys and ridges on it. Uh, these are from previous flakes that were taken off at the core. So um, the nice thing about flakes is they have very sharp edges, very, very sharp and very thin, depending on what you use to strike with. Um, as we'll see, uh, as you'll see in some of the later videos about the Acheulean uh, industry, they use two different kinds of objects to strike uh, stones with. They use stones, which produce nice rough flakes, and then they use softer material like bone, antler, that, or maybe even wood, to produce longer, thinner flakes so that you get a, a, a thinner profile on the tool. Uh, it's really fascinating. Um, 
Right. And then, of course, you have hammerstones or anvils. The difference between a hammerstone and an anvil, you strike something with a hammerstone and you strike it on an anvil. That's the difference. You don't need an anvil with a hammerstone. You don't need a hammerstone with an anvil. You can strike something onto the anvil, uh, you know, keep it between your legs, or if it's stationary in some other way, you strike an object on it and knock flakes off, whereas with the hammerstone, you hold it and knock the flakes off. Um, a hammerstone, though, can also be, and an anvil to some degree, can be used to access other resources as well. Crack open nuts. Cracking open bones to get it marrow, which is extremely nutritious. Um, these are usually cobblestones, river stones of some kind. They're relatively smooth, so you have a predictable surface to sort of strike with. Um, and they are easy to carry around. Now, there are some other sort of things to the anatomy of a, of a, of a flake or a stone tool that we should pay attention to. Uh, you notice this flat spot on the edge of the, this flake here, uh, just above the bulb of percussion. That is known as the striking platform. That is where the, that is where the, the force was applied. Uh, as I said, those sort of valleys on the back side of the flake are removal scars. The ripples that come out from the the bulb of produ bulb of percussion, excuse me. Um, uh, there's a great example of the bulb of percussion. You can see how it's the, it's round the way it's uh, bouncing the light. Uh, some techniques much later involved actually baking the stone. First, putting it into a fire or in hot coals for a certain period of time, that actually would harden the stone so that you would get sharper edges, uh, although it might also be a little more brittle. So, But that's also that's a challenge that modern blacksmiths have as well when making. You can create steel that is flexible but doesn't hold an edge well, or you can create steel that holds an edge very well but may shatter when you strike it on something. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the same trait kind of trade-off. Uh, finally, you have retouching. Uh, retouching is where you make one pass knocking off flakes, and then you come back and make another pass with, as I was describing before, a softer uh, per uh, percussive instrument of some kind uh, to get more fine details and finer... Um, uh, and a thinner profile on the tool. Now, last thing I want to talk about, and we'll get further into this when we talk about sort of scavenging and hunting. Um, why, what's the impact of stone tools? Well, um, huge. Stone tools are used to process food. They gave our ancestors access to foods they may not have been able to eat otherwise. Meat, of course, comes to mind. Uh, it's a big question whether at first meat was being hunted or scavenged. It's more likely it was scavenged, I think. Um, but it lets you get to the center of the bones, to crack the bones open so you can eat marrow. That is something you can't do without tools. Um, but you can also process plants with it. So plants that would otherwise be too tough to eat, to chew, and to digest can be made the nutrients can be made bioavailable by processing it uh, mechanically or in terms of later on cooking. Uh, we know these were important things because oftentimes the quarry sites are up to um, 10 kilometers away. So people walk a long way to find the rock to make these tools. They would make them there and then they would carry them back to their home range uh, sometimes also possibly deposited in them out along the, 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 in the landscape on their range so that they were never too far from a tool if the one they had broke. They also take a strong energetic commitment. Once you get good at it, you can make a decent Acheulean uh, hand axe in about 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, uh, but you're working and using, you know, one to two pound or more weights that whole time. Um, that is a strong energetic commitment, so it better pay off. And it's pretty clear that it did. 
Okay, thank you very much for joining me again. Uh, we're going to get a bit more into Stone Tools uh, in a little bit here. But um, uh, until then, take care of yourself, have a great week, and I will see you soon. Bye.